Well, when my son was about, about seven, uh, I started working on cars, uh, primarily to provide some sort of opportunity for him to learn how it works. After he had been doing this for a couple of years, I said, you know, if you end up doing the, this mechanicing work and all you learn about is how to fix cars, then you're doing it wrong. This actually should be a good way to explore how the world works and so forth. Well, today I'm going to describe a little bit of uh, tinkering. We're going to go under the hood of nature a little bit and see how the details of that work. And it's going to be rather surprising because you don't have to go very far from home uh, to, get to, uh, to get to a part of the universe where the rules are very, very different from what we see every day. First of all, let's get oriented as to where we are, uh, both in the universe and in scale. Here's a picture of the Milky Way right there from some observatory. And you'll notice that it's a flat band across the sky. That's because we live in a disk-shaped galaxy. And that happens to be the direction towards the center of the disk. So it's flat. And we're looking that way, so it makes a band across the sky. Takes light about 10, 000, sorry, takes light about 25,000 years to get from the center of our galaxy to here. It takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to here, so that gives you a sense of scale. Now let's change scale a little bit more. Here's a, a picture uh, taken with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. All these little smudges on here are galaxies. All those galaxies are about the same size as our galaxy. So each one of these, it takes light perhaps 100,000 years to go across. So these are big. And this thing is so far away that the light has been traveling from it to us perhaps for a couple of billion years. So the universe is big. So that bounds us on the high side, uh, on, the, on the large side. Now if we go on to the small size, up here, I've got a, a picture of an atom. That atom is about, it would take about a million of those atoms to go across the diameter of a hair. And then if you look at what the Large Hadron Collider, the new particle accelerator in Europe, is doing, the events that they create, they're probing spaces that are perhaps a billion times smaller than this. So in a certain sense, we live in a medium space between the huge scale of the, the sort of cosmological scale of the universe and this subatomic scale on which it go, things go on. But the small scale is very important to us because we're all made of atoms. And the whole world around us is made of atoms. So it's interesting to take a look and see how those atoms behave. Um, I'm going to actually start out using light uh, as an example for that. So we'll be following the light all the, all the way through here. Well, one of the things, this is just, uh, this is a picture of what the world used to look like. Uh, you go over here and you'd fall off the edge. Um, the thing is, though, if you spent your entire life here, say, between Roanoke Rapids and South Hill, um, if you stayed right in there all the time, a flat universe model is perfect. You don't need anything any better. I, like I say, we don't need any highfalutin round earth theories for that. But if you go out over the edge, your two theories, your round earth theory and your falling off the edge theory, are going to give very different results. So before you go sailing, you would like to know which is the correct one. So uh, sometimes you have to, you like to use your, uh, you like to use the knowledge that you have about the world around you. But if you get very far from home, you need to check what you know occasionally, because they might not do things the same way everywhere else. So you have to, you have to keep in mind what, what transfers and what doesn't. OK, this is, uh, this is something that's pretty common. Here's a beautiful set of nice straight waves rolling into a shore up top. We've all seen this. But then look, uh, look over here, and you'll see that these waves are coming in here. And this little opening here, you can think of that as a little slit for the waves to come through. And look. Out from that, you have these beautiful little almost circular wave fronts coming out. And then you'll notice that waves coming from over here, there's other little arcs, they interfere with those. So where the peak of one of these waves hits the peak of one of these waves, water is higher than it would have been. When a valley of this wave hits a peak of this one, it cancels out kind of. 
So we called that constructive and destructive interference. We're going to explore light to see how this behavior in the small world is, is similar in some ways, but also very different than the kind of waves we uh, deal with. The way we're going to do it is to uh, do a little experimental setup. We're going to have a little slit here or a little pinhole that light can go through. The light will go here and will illuminate two more pinholes. So this is in a plane. Uh, the light from these two pinholes goes over here and illuminates this back wall. This is the surprising pattern that comes from this. You have this, uh, this uh, row of sort of undulating brightness on the back. That's because the bright spots are where the light from this hole and this hole have constructive interference, that is the peaks line up, and the low spots are where a peak and a valley hit and they just cancel each other out. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at this and see what it looks like in the case of light. Here's a picture from, uh, okay, well, light is a wave, and what we mean by that is that it has all of these properties of waves. You make a, a sl double slit like that and you get interference as you expect. So it looks like a wave. Here's a drawing from 1803 by Thomas Young, who did the first experiment of this sort. And this is a picture he drew of two, see the circular waves going out from one pinhole and then from another one. And then he looked at the wave height here, the peaks and the valleys of the waves over here on the back side. So the waves propagate across there and we see what it looks like back there. That was his drawing. And he did it also with sunlight. And with the uh, sunlight, uh, he uh, was able to show that light did, in fact, have these same interference properties as water waves. And he said, and this was a wonderful thing, because anyone who had a little bit of uh, material to make a couple of slits out of in a sunny day could repeat the experiment himself. So this was a, but you've got to think to do it, is a thing. Um, Okay, let's, let's take a look here and, and see what happens. What, what does this interference look like with light? Here's the, somebody took a red laser, just like the one I'm pointing at the screen with here, and they put it through a slit. The light goes through and it illuminates a pattern on the back surface like that. Okay, so that's not unexpected. Then I open an additional slit next to it and it produces this interference pattern. But one thing to note here is that while there are brighter places, as you would expect if we open up more holes, there are some places here, there's little dark lines between. By opening another hole, we actually made it dimmer at some places than it was up here. So somehow we've taken away light from certain areas by opening another hole for the light to come through. So that's getting kind of interesting, okay? All right, so we, we've, we've got this, so what's going on there? And we know from our discussion earlier that, the, um, that what, what really is going on there is we're getting destructive interference. One of the, the light through one of the slits is going up at that point, and the other one is going down, so you end up averaging to zero. So you can actually have places with no light on there. So that's what we expect. Okay, what I'm going to do here, though, is to say, let's do another experiment. We've got the same setup. We're illuminating these two, uh, these two slits. Since the slits are illuminated from this point here, both of those slits, the light coming to this slit and this slit, have taken exactly the same amount of time. So the waves going through each of those are all going together. The word that you use for that, you say that the light is coherent because all the the they go the the uh, oscillations are all in phase. You would say there. Uh, so the, and then it's going to come over here, and here's our pattern. Okay. So what we're going to ask is what happens if we turn the light down to very very dim levels, go to the dimmest levels we can. So we do that and. First thing we notice here is that rather than having that nice uniform thing, instead our sensitive detector shows just a little spot lit up. 
by the thing. So we find out that there's a granularity to the light. It, it's light, when we detect it, looks like individual photons. It looks like particles. Okay, go to the film, Cheryl. There we go. But then as we run, the, as we run our experiment longer, it looks sort of random, okay? So we're getting more and more light through here. But these things all hitting randomly, you know, you're, you're going to have a hard time predicting where the next one is going to fall. But we keep going here for a while, and I'm going to speed it up in a minute here. We're going to, uh, you'll see that we're starting to see some patterns to this. The, so what's happening here is, is that the, you can see it filling in rapidly now. What's happening is that the unseen is actually causing, you've got this unseen distribution that these things are going to have to follow. And so we end up, after a while, looking at something that looks very much like this, but it was made up of a whole bunch of little guys that none of them seemed to know where they were going. So what's going on here? You say, okay, well, that, I had that one particle come through. And you say, oh, yeah, it just came through here and, uh, and ended up over here. But to create this pattern, we required that something go through both of those slits. So how did we detect one little photon over here and we had two slits over here? How did that happen? Well, the, uh, the theory of quantum mechanics that was developed in the 1920s, people realized that these, part, that these things act, act like waves when they're going through here. So part of that wave went through here and part of it went through here and it it basically um, is interfering with itself. So you have an underlying pattern. So this unseen underlying pattern is sort of telling these things where to go, but individually you don't have a whole lot of luck in knowing where, anybody, where each one would come. And so uh, the question is, why is it like this? What, why do things behave like this? And so here we go and with just a few events, you look at that and you wouldn't have any idea that that's an interference pattern. But when we run it for a while, we have our pattern back. So what's going on is we realize that, that nature, it really looks probabilistic. It looks like you can't, that the amount that you can say from individual events is quite limited. But if you do enough of them, you can tell what's, what's going on. Now, Albert Einstein here, was, he was one of the founders of quantum mechanics, but the younger crew that came along in the 1920s, Schrodinger, famous of the cat, and uh, Heisenberg and Dirac, who were these people developing quantum mechanics in the 1920s, uh, believed that, that nature was fundamentally, was fundamentally statistical, that it was, it was fundamentally uncertain in, in how it was going to work. Einstein was thinking that we just didn't have a good enough theory yet, and if he had a better theory that we could predict where these things were going to come. Well, it turns out it looks like in this case he was wrong. It looks like the universe is fundamentally uncertain because the theories that were developed based on this uncertainty are absolutely perfect. I mean, they, they, this is, if there's any kind of bedrock rule of the universe right now, it's certainly quantum mechanics. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that is that these quantum states are just like a casino because you can go to a casino and you play a couple of games and you can win or lose and so on like that and you got a chance of winning, a chance of losing, but since you only play a small number of times you might come out ahead or behind or whatever. The casino never loses because uh, the casino gets this case where they've run a zillion of these things so they know exactly what they're going to get. So at the end of the year, they can tell within a tiny fraction of a percent what's going to happen. You are there doing your few games, and you could end up over here or you could end up over here. You don't know whether you'll win or lose, but there's some probability of it. So it is fundamentally statistical in that way. But the mathematical theory that was developed to explain this kind of behavior, and it's a nice de detailed theory. You can actually calculate all sorts of 
uh, interesting properties of things. Turns out it's really critical in a modern uh, technical society. If you're going to be designing uh, transistors in computer chips or whatever, you have to have it there. You're doing laser physics to uh, develop one thing or another. You have to use it. And here we've got a protein all strung out to begin with and then getting folded into some shape so that it can pr produce some um, uh, biological material that we need in our bodies. All these things you need to be able to do the uh, uh, do the uh, quantum mechanical uh, calculations. Um, in summary, though, I'd say that this is very, very strange behavior. But on the other hand, if you look at the world around us, the world itself is pretty daggone strange. We're just used to it. And so uh, my guess is, is that if we actually saw this on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, we would think it was perfectly normal. Uh, and we, but. Instead, we actually have to look under the hood a little bit to see it, so we get surprised. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's just a quick glimpse under the hood. Thank you.